Hello, everybody. James here, WSI, and I am very privileged to bring back, uh, I imagine, because uh, as I interview him, the first interview hasn't gone out yet, but one of the most popular guests we've ever had, I'm sure. Uh, it's Greg the Hammer Valentine. Thank you once again for doing this. You bet, man. I yeah. enjoy it. Dude, uh, uh, Don Morocco, uh, I know I surprised you with Don. I know I got you to tell the story about how he got fired, but, I mean, Don's the man, isn't he? Oh, God. Uh, when you told me that Dom was going to be on, I almost got a little intimidated. Like, oh, I was starstruck. But I love Dom Morocco. And we're the same age, and we started around the same year. And, uh, <clears throat> but God, he, when he first, what a difference he, him now, you know, he's aged. But back then, he was like Dom Morocco, the surf body, drop kicks. And then he turned into this nasty heel. I used to walk up to the camera and blow boogers at the camera. And uh, so what a transformation. And now he's back to sweet Don. You know? <laughs> See, I only know him as, a, as the sweetheart. But, I mean, as far as I can tell, even back in the day, well, he was a sweetheart he as well. Me, he was, when, he, when he did that sort of thing, he wasn't mean. Mm. That was just his his character, you know, but he loved being a heel. Have you ever seen anybody with shoulders as big as Don's? Not at the time when he was, uh, oh, when he worked out, you know, he was like unbelievable. You know, I I got sort of, my, my main thing is I got big arms, big legs, whatever. The shoulders, you know, they look okay, but I could never really work them out too much because they always got sore, you know? And uh, <clears throat> so the you don't need the shoulders for punches. I used to work a bag like a boxer. But God, he used to do those and shrugs and massive shoulders. I know, um, I know Animal. I think it was Animal. He used to do these shoulder presses. What was it, over three hundred pounds or something like that? Animal, with the, yeah, yeah. With the, yeah, Road Warrior Animal with the with the barbell behind his neck. It's like I just yeah. I can't imagine how that won't screw someone's neck up well, yeah, really badly. Yeah, yeah. And Road Warrior Hawk, same thing. And when I used to go work out with him at the World's Gym in Florida, he'd get on these shoulders and do, and, and I just. <laughs> I couldn't match him, but I mean that's that's how these guys were so big, and then they could grab the guys and throw them like crazy. That's how they got over so much because they were legitimately really strong. Didn't know how to wrestle, but <laughs> <laughs> there may have been a few who were strong and may not know how to wrestle. I think that might be a common theme. Yeah. But uh, do you know what? Because right? this this interview is about you, and I always like to ask guys, always the bigger guys as well. Do you remember your records for bench press, squats, deadlifts? Oh, I, I had a 400. I mean, this is good for me. I had a 400-pound bench press. And uh, some guys at five, six. But for a guy that – I hated lifting weights. I just did it because I knew it was good for me. Uh, but I had a legitimate 400-pound bench press. And uh, – a squat, I could squat. I, you know, I really don't know. I don't. I never did that for a maximum. Um, you know, but I was good at. It. I had good. You know, and I used to do reps with three hundred pounds. You know, so I was a rep guy. You know, I when I did that, I used to get like three twenty five pounds on and and work out like that and do reps. You know. And just real slow and concentrated. Um, and if you keep trying to go for your top uh, mark all the time, you end up blowing blowing muscle. And uh, I tore this pec a little bit, so I stopped doing heavy. I just started doing a lot of reps. And, uh, you know, so I'm not in a weightlifting contest, but the Road Warriors and Massive shoulders, you know, that was their gimmick. They had to look like that. Oh, you, you must have been in the gym with all the big stars at the time. Or, you know, I don't know if like if you're a bad guy, all the bad guys and all the good guys and all the good guys, but uh, who was, uh, all all in all, let's say their totals, who was the absolute strongest in the gym? 
Uh, well, the road warriors are up there, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> be honest with you, I uh, wow, Ken Ken Patera, of course. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to think of the guys. When I was in New York, I stayed away from the gym. <laughs> <laughs> I wrestled 45 minutes minimum every night of the week. Who in the hell needs to go to the gym? Mm. I just, you know, I I kept the biceps looking good. <laughs> it's a different type of being in shape. You know, you, you don't have to look like a, a bodybuilder and be a wrestler at the same time. Yeah, I suppose when when the national expansion happened, that you're on planes a lot more, you're traveling even more. You know, more of your days taken up traveling than the other. But then, you know, I would travel and sleep on airplanes all day long. But I would and fly out to the West Coast. One of the first things I would do is I would rent a car, or get a cab, and I'd go to the gym even before I checked out. I'd just do a quick forty five minute workout. And brings me back to center. Then I go to the hotel, take a nap, and be ready to wrestle that night. You know, it was like, every day was like that. Mm. So it's yeah. not about working out all the time. It's like the, I worked out in the ring. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, making money and working out. Yeah, it's 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 great cardio and everything. So yeah. like, so what year did you just start thinking, man, the travel's getting too much. I just I just can't hit the gym five six days a week anymore. Uh, well, if I was on the road, I'd, I'd go there for 45 minutes and just go through the motions or anything. And, I mean, I wrestled nonstop from the 70s all the way through the 80s, all, all the way to almost 2004, and then I had enough. <laughs> so that's – how many years is that? You know? uh, it's got to be at least 30. Yeah, at least 30 years. I think <laughs> you put your time in. So when I got inducted in the Hall of Fame, I go – I think it's time to slow down a little bit. And uh, <laughs> I don't even know how old I was. Uh, it don't matter. It's how you feel. I, I don't even think, of, you know, it's just a number anyway. And uh, the only number you really should cons be concerned about is your blood pressure and and your uh, uh, blood count, your diabetic, whatever. You, you should worry about those figures. Don't worry about anything else. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. With... How much money you got in the bank? Baby. Yeah, man, absolutely, absolutely. Do you know what? Right, I, I, because we were talking about Don again a couple of days, uh, and we were talking with Don as well, and I couldn't help but stir the pot and say, "Remember when Don got fired?" And you tell the great story. But you also mentioned a couple of days ago that Don wasn't the only one to sort of get called during that European tour or after the European tour because the Bulldogs went, and we sort of know why. But I believe Bob Orton Jr. was also let go. And Don has told a version of the story. And I was wondering. I don't if... remember Bob. I don't, excuse me, but I don't remember Bob Orton being on that tour. I th the one where we all got fired. I remember Junkyard Dog, the Bulldogs, Don Morocco. I, you know, Cowboy could have been on it, but I don't think so. Um, and everybody at Junkyard Dog, they all got fired. Um, I don't remember though. I don't remember him being on the tour. Man, I'm hoping I've not just absolutely come up with something, some complete nonsense there. Um, I'll tell you what, well, I was actually going to say, do you remember how Bob got fired? I think it was some incident on a plane, if you remember that. Or if, I think that's what Don said. Is that the one? And was Piper with him? Oh, I, I just don't know that story, but I got, I have Bob's number. You want me to call him? <laughs> no, we'll, uh, we'll leave Bob for now. I'll have to ask Bob himself okay. whenever I get to it. I'll tell you what, we'll go to some uh, fan questions. And actually, just before I get to a fan question, I want to ask you this. How old were you when you realized what your dad did for a living? So I know, obviously, he would have done it, you know, pretty much when you were born. But, like, what I'm age probably, were you when you understood yeah. it? Well, they used to... I grew up with my grandparents and they and my mother and they would bring me out when my dad was on TV and we lived in, in the suburbs of Seattle and he'd come on and it was some it was Texas Championship Wrestling and they these they sent it out all over the country in the US and so Texas Championship Wrestling was 
the first nationwide wrestling was on television and Johnny Valentine was on there all the time. So they say, Greg, Greg, your dad's on TV. And I go watch him. So, <laughs> Did you uh, did your dad discourage you from getting into the business? Because we hear that quite a lot with wrestling families. I uh, well, I, he flew me down. I told I think I told the story yesterday that he flew me in, and I went uh, uh, I went on the road with him, and and um, I wasn't even thinking about being a wrestler. I used to laugh at that Portland wrestling, but I watched my dad and I watched him wrestle. And I go, oh my god. But then I got hooked, and I knew I knew I knew I could do this. This was my calling. But I maybe I didn't know 100% I could do it, but I knew I wanted to do it. And so, you know, he he hooked me up. Do you remember your first ever payoff? Yeah, fifty dollars, I think. Mm. <laughs> Fifty dollars. Hey, that's not bad. And it that. stayed that way. Fifty dollars a night, um, <laughs> and three nights a week or something. You know, <laughs> do you, brutal. Do you remember the first, like at the time, mega superstar that you were in the ring with? Apart from your dad, because I'm sure you tagged with your dad early. But do you remember the first superstar, like in a singles match that you wrestled, that you got really intimidated by the name? Angelo Mosca. Yes. King Kong Mosca. Uh, an ultimate football player, played for the Hamilton Tiger Cats over here in Canada or up in Canada. Mm -hmm. He's in the Hall of Fame. He looked like a gorilla. Nice guy, though. And uh, I wrestled him. Mm -hmm. Didn't last too long. <laughs> I, gave him, I, I just was learning how to do arm drags, so I gave him some arm drags. And then he... Squish me. <laughs> hey, that's another good question, though. What did your training consist of? Because obviously these days, you know, you've got hermetically sealed, you know, brand new multi-million dollar facilities, you know, in WWE's case at least. What was your training consisting of? Uh, now, you know what? Uh, I learned all my stuff. I, I didn't work out in the gym much with in the ring with other guys. I, lo I learned... I would show up and I'd wrestle somebody and I'd get paid for it. And that's how I started out with, uh, with Stu Hart. And also uh, then I went and wrestled in Detroit, Michigan for the Sheik, the original Sheik, and ride with Bobo Brazil and, and uh, what's his name, Haystack Calhoun, and, and wrestle somebody that night, and it was all ad lib for me. You understand ad lib? Yeah, absolutely. I just went in there and I just, and a lot of it was memory of watching my dad for for six months, studying what he did, and I just emulated it, not copied it, and emulated it, emulated it, but it just evolved. And I never, nobody really taught me too much. Mm. Taught me, Stu Hart pushed me around a little bit, and that's it. <laughs> I didn't do high spots. Uh, maybe it wouldn't be. I call them one spots. I might do one thing, boom, and then it's back to grabbing a hold and wrestling. You know, ground pound. Do you do a Stu Hart impression? Eh. <laughs> eh. Yeah. I remember when he picked me up, I flew up there and it was 40 below zero at the Calgary airport. And I'm coming out there and and I had a friggin' t-shirt and I'm freezing. I think my dad sent me up there with no coat and no wrestling shoes. Hey, get on that plane and go. So Stu saw my arms. He showed up in this big limo, or not a limo, but a Fleetwood Cadillac. And he was, he had shower shoes on and a t-shirt on too and it was freezing outside and he goes eh, eh, eh. you got big arms you're like your father you look like your daddy eh. come on get in that car so then we go i'm thinking we're going to go to the hotel i don't know what we're going to do he picked me up we go to a safeway store Big uh, 
grocery store there and he backs he had, he backs his fleet with it and it was almost like it was almost like a limousine but it wasn't it's kind of a you know what a fleet is right mm. and he opened it back in and then they threw all these vegetables tons of bananas all kinds of fruit in the back and they close it up now we go to Stu's house and I just got to Canada right <laughs> Uh, you know, so we pull up in this big house on the hill all by itself. And it was three stories. And I'm a big monster fan. So remind me of the monsters uh, house. Like Mockingbird you know Lane. Yeah, is? Was it like uh, 1616 Mockingbird Lane or something like that? I can't remember the address. <laughs> but it's on top of the hill. Three stories. There was cats all over the place. I remember that there. There must have been a hundred cats running all over the place. So he he lifts up the back like a garage door and dumps all these vegetables in there and then shuts it down. He goes, eh, that's for the kids. Now, mind you, he had 13 or 12. Well, no, 13 cats and 12 kids. Sorry. That's it. <laughs> and his grandpa or his dad, Brett's grandpa, but Stu's dad's had a little room in the corner down there. And when I walked in, I go, hey, hi, sir. And, and Stu goes, get back in there, you dad. <laughs> Don't talk to get back in your room. He talked that way to his dad. So I'm like, oh, man. But he took care of him, you know, so a lot of people would have threw their dad out on the street. At least he took care of him, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Did, <laughs> did, you ever, did you ever see the wrestling bear at any point in, in the house? Any what? The, the wrestling bear. Was it Terrible Ted? Terrible Ted. Yeah. You know, the animal. Like, wrestling. Yeah, the brown what, what's that? bear. B E A R. I'm sorry, the audio is not the best. Oh, a bear. Yeah. Was it? Did I ever see the bear that Stu had? Did he yeah. have a bear? Uh, yeah. Apparently, I don't remember that, but I re I remember they had a guy that brought the bear up and they wrestled him in the ring. Mm. I don't know if he actually had a bear. I must have already been gone. Yeah. I would have remembered that. I'm a big fan of bears. Yeah. And I'm scared of them too, but I love bears. <laughs> I think, um, as far as I can remember, they had someone who dropped remember, a bear off and living under the house. Super, I remember seeing superstar Billy Graham. He looked like a bear. And I, <laughs> he broke in. He broke in the same time I did. Oh, did he really? What what year yeah. is this? Are we talking 71? 1970. 1970. Yeah. Man, Billy Graham. Now, from Don... I've heard quite a few stories, quite a few of them we never repeated on the podcast. We told each other, well, he told me after hours, but there was a story that goes that um, uh, Billy thanked Stu for putting him up and training him by giving him two TV sets. And then at a later date, the pol after Graham had left, the police turned up and asked for the TV sets back because they were stolen. <laughs> I can't confirm that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Was Billy was just Billy always into something dodgy? Yeah, he was. He was out there, man, and he was from Arizona, so shit. And uh, he was out there. Boy, wow! Mm. He, uh, everybody kind of copied his look after, you know, Jesse Ventura copied that look, and then. Biggest star of ever, Hulk Hogan, copied Billy Graham's look with a bandana and uh, muscles. And but Hogan, Hogan was, you know, he had his own interview and everything, his own stick, but uh, copied that look. I always thought that Billy Graham and Dusty's presentations, I know the bodies are completely different, but their interview styles, even they had a bit of a lisp, oh, was you, quite you similar. That, definitely. <laughs> the best body was Dusty Rhodes, right? <laughs> he's, he's the proof that you did not need to have a good body 
to be a superstar. And uh, he had that razzmatazz and then those titties jumping up and down. <laughs> but I'm a big fan of Dusty. He had great friggin' interviews. And uh, superstar Billy Graham, he was like, wow, I'm the man. He had great interviews, too. So that's how he got over back. Was, but, you know, Billy Graham, I don't think, was all that good of a worker. But I didn't watch that many of his matches. I might maybe fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> but Dusty, Dusty was entertaining. And when he made the comeback, it was like, and for being a, a I'll be kind, pleasantly plump or a little overweight. This son of a bitch was, he had a heart of gold and he could go forever. And he did his own comebacks. With the, <laughs> the bolo punches. And... You know, with Superstar, one of the bits that I always find most interesting is when he got really depressed and then he came back and shaved his head and came back as a karate master. Yeah. <laughs> what, what was that about? Well, he's losing his friggin' hair anyway, so he shaved his head. Yeah. It's called recreating yourself, you know. And uh, he did he did a good job of that. We, well, but, we, you know, he's a good man. He's a good man. Yeah, he's not doing very well health wise at the moment as well. He seems to have every single ailment at the moment. I believe. I, I yeah. just, he's been fighting him for a long time too, and he's he's still hanging in there. God bless him. Yeah, absolutely. I just I think he's got a GoFundMe at the moment as well. So if you want to help out Superstar, uh, hunt out a GoFundMe and uh, donate some money. Uh, I'm going to ask a, a couple of fan questions now. And let me see. Here's one, and I don't know who wrote it in, but he said, what was the most significant injury you picked up in your career and how did it happen? All right. I'm, it's really bright in here. I'm just going to go off and on. Oh, no, yeah. No, carry on. Um, my, my worst, uh, injury was it came after all those, all the, all the time in the NWA, WCW, WWF, WWE, whatever. I never got hurt that bad. But then I did a show, it was an independent show in Chicago at the, one of those stadiums, uh, I think it was a soccer stadium or something out in the suburbs of Chicago. And uh, I'll start, I'll, I'll remember it, I think. And, and it's not important, but it was a big independent and Hulk Hogan was on it, but he was not wrestling. He was signing autographs. And it was me and Beefcake against the Nasty Boys. And they had some other good matches and uh it was in this stadium out by midway field and so this injury i already wrestled and we were leaving and i went they had these steps these weird steps and i went to step down and i missed a step and it's just a weird thing but i tore my knee and i tore my quad uh on my right side tore my quad all the way up my leg, but it didn't go all the way up. I mean, it still was hanging on by a thread. And I'm trying to walk, and I kept falling down, and I went right. Uh, I didn't go to the hospital. I said, I'll go back to Florida. So I went to the hotel and just took it easy and, and <clears throat> went back and had surgery and, and attached it to my knee. <clears throat> this injury... I had to keep my legs straight. Now listen to this. I had to keep my legs straight for one year. Oh, no. Straight. Sitting on the toilet, straight. I like couldn't drive a car, but I did anyway. Eventually, I said, I got to get out of this house. So I would drive the car with my crutch, right? <laughs> <laughs> Short trips, so. though. And uh, for a year, you know, I'd go to the beach, and, and, and I managed to just keep active as I could. But can you imagine having to keep your legs straight? Uh, you know, it was hard on the old lady. There was no, there was no, uh, 
good love making going on there at that time because you had, you had to be on the had, what am i going to drag around this crutch and say come over here honey <laughs> and god bless my wife she's been through so much with me and i love her so much and <clears throat> but she helped me get through that and then <clears throat> so a year and then after that i um uh, I'm getting on a whim here, but I got to tell a story. Yeah, please so, do. Please do. Yeah. So the second year, I start going to rehab. Now, I've been through keeping my legs straight for a year. Now I'm going to go to rehab, and then they're going to start. Uh, I would go in there, and they'd start, un you know, making me bend it, right? A little bit every I – I went three times, three times a week for a year. And I finally got it to where I could bend it all the way. And then I started working out with a thing. And then, my God, after that, yeah, after they finally got it to where I could bend it, it took a year to do that. Then my third year was going down there and working and working out and just walk and walk and on the treadmill and that. And, uh, I could finally run a little bit now, just barely. Like if I went out in the traffic and a bunch of cars are coming, I'd probably get ran over. But I can run a little bit, trot a little bit. But that was devastating to me. But when I walk through the airports, I make myself walk fast. Mm. And so I'm I'm good now. But I'm, I'm dealing with my own knee injury at the moment. I mean, I can't imagine a year because – as soon as you stop using your leg, it just atrophies so quickly that I found I me. Mean, I didn't move mine for a week, and it seemed to shrink in half. And and it takes me so long to stretch it out fully. And then when I stretch it out fully, it takes me ages to be able to bend it back again. And this is after a month. So I mean, for a year, I can't. Be, no wonder you couldn't. Why well, I, I went through that a year. I was straight, and took a year to to loosen, yeah. uh, bend it. That's just the way it takes. And I was fifty some years old. I don't, you're in your 30s, right? You yeah. Said? yeah, yeah. So you you got that on your side. But once you get 50 and, and on that, it takes forever to heal. Up. <laughs> Man, My I, God. I, I, well, I'm, I'm glad you. I'm glad you. You can't run in traffic still, but I'm glad you can. So run I a bit really anyway. got. I, they talked me into getting back into the ring, and I did a little bit. And I said, no, I ain't doing it. No. I just did some for the independent shows and. I couldn't do anything. I would, you know what it is? It's the, it's your brain. You're paranoid. You can do more than you think, but you still remember that injury. Mm -hmm. So it's still there. Yeah, I'm glad. I don't need to be in that freaking ring anymore. I'll arm wrestle somebody. But, you know. <laughs> I'm going to move on. Then I'm going to give you the next question. Margaret Gasparo asks, "What was the worst day week you ever had on the road? Was there something you just refused to do, <clears throat> like?" like refuse to do a creative direction or go to a town or work with someone. You just had the worst week ever and you just wouldn't do something. Well, that could have been when I was doing all these small towns for WWF. They had an A, a tour and a B tour and a C tour. But I must have been on the C tour that one week. <laughs> And we had to drive everywhere, and I had to wrestle with the Ultimate Warrior. Oh my God! And this was the—he was transitioning into becoming. This is before he wrestled Hogan and became the world champion, right? So I was his transition guy. I had to work with him, and it was god awful. He was horrible. So that was the worst week. I, and we did all the small towns in Florida and and uh, Georgia and all these spot show things. But there was good crowds, and uh, it was WWF shows, you know. So it was me and the Ultimate Warrior and Hercules against Jake the Snake or something. I don't know. Do you worst week in the business? <laughs> When you were, you know, you're, let's say, in the late 80s at this point, you're, you know, one of the veterans, you've got a lot to teach others. Are you specifically sort of singled out as somebody 
who gets put with all these big muscle guys to teach them something in the ring, and you were told you need to teach these guys something like a Ultimate Warrior yeah, or a Ted can't, RCD. You can't, you can't teach the warrior shit. <laughs> you know, he'd get in the ring and he'd want to run back and forth, so I just stood there and boxed him like this till he got tired. And then I'd kick him and hold him down. And then, well, he didn't know how to sell and, and grab his arm. But I'd make him, you know, and uh, and I'd hit him hard. And uh, but all he he didn't know jack shit about wrestling. <laughs> it was fucking horrible. Did he ever knock you out? It was worse than Hogan. <laughs> Did he ever KO you, knock you out? Actually, Hogan was good. He'd let me hold him down. Uh, but no, he he couldn't beat me up in a real fight on back in his best day. I'm just a different type of guy. He starts throwing punches at me. I'm going to leg dive him, and he's going to be like a turtle on his back. <laughs> what do I do now? So, you know, I can talk big now because he passed away. And I can kick your ass, warrior, but you're dead. Guess what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still alive. Do you know because you because you... I'm sorry you did. I really do. I I feel bad, and my wife uh, loved his wife, and we're all good friends. So. Mm. She she's still with WWE, isn't she? Uh, Warrior's wife, Dana, is it? I don't I don't know. He he had a he had a couple different wives. <laughs> mm. Um. So I don't know his original wife, but my wife Julie. Uh, but uh, I don't know his. I don't know Dan. Mm. With um, just because you mentioned Hulk Hogan before, and I wanted to ask this is uh, obviously when you're paired up with Hulk Hogan, you know that the payoff's going to be great. It's going to be better than anybody else. But in a singles match, let's say you're in a B town somewhere and you're headlining, who would you want to face as far as getting the best payoff? Who would who would your opponent be for the best pay uh, payoff? For all the guys in the world, of all the guys, in the world, apart, apart from apart from Hulk Hogan, which is obviously going to be the oh. number one. Well, you could wrestle Andre the Giant, or you could wrestle uh, Ultimate Warrior. Uh, it, 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 they took care of me when I wrestled Ronnie Garvin. We because we were like up in the card. You didn't have to be all the way on the top, but uh, Back in the day in the 90s, if you worked with Hogan or Warrior or uh, Jake the Snake or any of these top stars, you got a, you got a good payday. Mm. He took care of me and Rugged Ronnie Garvin, the Valentine Beefcake against uh, the uh, Bulldogs, or we would be main event by ourselves. Usually it was just a single on the top, but they sent Hogan somewhere. We did some beefcake and Valentine for the Bulldogs. We sold out everyone. Mm. So, with you know, the, with merchandise, do you remember the very first piece of merchandise you ever uh, had that you ever held in your hand? You know the LGN figure. I got one out there in the back of his car. Um, the LGN figure. And the first check I got for it was like ninety thousand dollars. Jesus, for a year, three months. Jesus, whaps. Yeah, I went up to Vince and complained about winning me and Beefcake going to get our get our belts back from the Bulldogs, and he wouldn't answer us. He says, "Yeah, I got your check here for uh, your first doll check, your action figure check." And he goes, you give them to us. And you know, it was the same. It was like $92,000. I go, whoa, this is 1985, right? $92,000 on one check for three months of figures. And it was, I was getting 5% of the total thing. Mm-hmm. WWE was getting a billion dollars <laughs> for my doll, <laughs> you know, <laughs> But I'm looking at $92,000 and said, shit, I don't even know if I can cash this at my bank. They're going to think it's a counterfeit. <laughs> do, you, uh, do you remember, like, throughout the years in the WWE, I'll talk, I'll talk other things apart from WWF soon enough, but do you remember 
the uh, percentage that you got for your merchandise going down over the years? Because I think I've spoke to Tito Santana, Bushwhacker Luke, other guys of that era, and they've all said the later doll money was like less than 1%. Well, you know, I, I think I get a little better than that, you know. Yeah. I was getting 5%. I think now it's uh, – I think I'm getting – I'm not really sure. I'll check on that. But it, my my stuff is pretty good. I think I think I, I, I signed a Legends contract, so I redid my contract. So I'm getting a little more money. I, I'll have to look at that. I don't want to – I'm thinking – they said 1%. Oh, oh, mine's I've, better. Than that. Someone mine's said better than that. someone said point zero two five to me once. I don't. Oh, I don't know if that no. was exaggerating. I'll let you know. Yeah. It's better than that. Yeah, I just I got a big. Yeah, I I do a lot of side stuff for too for them. I've signed a bunch of stickers and and they send me separate money for that. I'm always doing something. Mm. They pay me good for the legend series I did with them on. A and E network out here, and you'll probably get that over there. Um, so I'm, they're always doing added stuff. I just did a uh, some a documentary in Yokozuna, and they paid me real good for that. And uh, that was on A and E, so it'll be on YouTube and all that. So, so I'm I'm still making good money from it. It's a good pension. I mean, that's a great pension. It sounds yeah, like. it's a it's it's a good pension, and you know why I don't have to pay taxes on it because it's called royalties. Oh, it's stuff from twenty years ago. So that's one thing about our government. We, I mean, I have to put down what the what they paid me, but uh, it's a different tax uh, thing. So it's like royalties and religion are tax free in America, then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, religion. Yeah, over here. Yeah, I uh, oh, I had one. Oh, do you know what? Someone actually wrote in. I don't know where they put it, but I'll have to ask this now. Did you ever think of merchandising the "I broke Wahoo's leg" T-shirt, or was that just never going to happen? Well, I've got some of those shirts now. Would you like my address? Yes, <laughs> I would. And, oh, you'll have to send me one. <laughs> yeah, so I've I've got a bunch of shirts at my house, but. Uh, uh, there's a place I got a, a friend that makes those for me, and uh, back in back in '83, I don't want you buying it from him, buying it from, buying it from me. <laughs> back in '83, though, was there ever any consideration for merchandising as a bad guy? To, you know, to sell those T-shirts or just never? That was never going to happen. You know, it's such an iconic thing. I broke Wahoo's leg. That. It took forever to catch on, but uh, that was George Scott's idea. I I actually broke Wahoo's leg before I came back in '85 and broke Tito's leg. <laughs> and I should I should get a shirt saying I broke Tito Wahoo Chief J Strombo whoever's leg. <laughs> <laughs> it should just be I broke dot dot dot's leg, and then yeah, you can fill yeah, it in yeah. yourself. I'm gonna make out some, you uh, know. <laughs> I'll send you all my email. Good Greg night. Valentine 49 gmail.com. Should I edit that out of the full episode or are you leaving it in the podcast? Yeah, leave that. Greg Valentine 49 gmail.com. 49 is my birthday. There you go. So you can you, order 49. some t you can order some t-shirts from there then. Um yeah. who am I gonna write? I'll, I'll figure out I'm gonna get get a handler. I got a bunch of people that want to handle me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lucky boy. And and, uh, and especially in Vegas, I'm I'm in the marketing area out there, so I'm gonna do some of my own stuff. And I and my I own my own name, and this of course wouldn't bother me me selling my own shit too. So. No, nah. Ivan, who came up with the hammer? Actually, I I'm gonna give credit to an announcer out here. He's on AEW right now. Tony Schiavone. Really? Yeah. So he was on NWA Mid Atlantic Wrestling. Uh, if it wasn't Bob Cottle and David Crockett, Tony Schiavone came in and started doing some of the matches too, right? Mm -hmm. Commentating. 
And he would say, here comes the hammer, because I'd throw the guy outside on the floor and I'd bring him up and bring him back over him like my dad used to be, Johnny Valentine. I'd throw that big hammer across and a big boom. And Tony Schiavone said, here comes that hammer. And then it just evolved into Greg the Hammer Valentine. There you go. That's a good story. With uh, I, I know obviously you're gonna you don't hear the commentators when you're wrestling. I don't know if you ever went back uh, at the time and watched back some of the shows and heard the commentators. But which commentator, which announcer, did you feel did the best job of putting you over as a as a threat, as a wrestler, as a world champion? Who was your favorite that you thought would do the best job commentating and uh, and uh, bigging you up essentially? Well, Gorilla Monsoon. Vince McMahon himself, when he used to announce. Uh, mean Gene Okerlund. These are all WWF guys. Uh, Lord Alfred Hayes. Um, and these guys believed in me, and they, ta- they, talk- they talked good about me, and they wanted me to get over it, but they talked the truth about me. If I c- couldn't produce, they wouldn't say shit, right? <laughs> And they'd say it takes him 10 minutes to warm up, which is true. And down in the Mid-Atlantic in the Charlotte area, NWA, it was David Crockett, Tony Schiavone, and this basketball announcer, Bob Cottle. And they were slower to talk, but they got the story across. And I used to hate David Crockett's, uh, you know, his announcing, but I listened to it. Now it was friggin' good. You know, it was very detailed. It wasn't real fast. Uh, there wasn't a lot of charisma with David Crockett, but it, Bob Cottle, they were great. And then you had Tony Schiavone. He stepped it up some. Mm. But my all-time favorites was Vince McMahon when he was announcer, Gorilla Monsoon. You know, Vince was great on the Saturday night's main event, right? Mm. And Jesse Ventura, there's another one. And Mean Gene Okerlund, oh, my God. So the, all the matches that you can get on the YouTube from the Garden, bring up Ricky Steamboat, me against Tio Santana, me against Hulk Hogan, they're all over the place. And, and Mean Gene and, and Vince McMahon and all these, you know, Vince and Jesse Ventura, they did all those Saturday nights made a bit. They were they were great. Yeah. Great announcements. Do you know, because you mentioned Jesse's name, I thought I'd ask you this, is how many... Uh, so you broke in in 1970. Obviously, Jesse, uh, one of his claims to fame within the business is that he tried to start a union. When was the first time, or do you remember anybody else in the business trying to start a union within wrestling? Yes, Johnny Valentine. Really? Yeah, and that's what, uh, that's when they, they kind of... They got him away from New York for a while. I guess I don't think Vince Senior maybe did Vince Senior. Nobody wanted anybody to have, uh, and Vince Senior was still alive then, of course. So I remember Johnny Valentine, and it was somebody else that were trying to get some kind of a um, union thing. It never worked, but it put heat on my dad. But my dad, nevertheless, went back to Texas and then went to the Carolinas and made a ton of money there and got that place going. Uh, So then there was the next one was Jesse Ventura. And he wanted, he tried to start a union and they fired Jesse. And then that's when Jesse sued Vince and he got like a million dollars. So, did you hear that part of it? Yeah. Now that was that because we were talking before. That was about royalties Thanks. on videotapes because he was told only Hulk yeah. Hogan got royalties, or Hulk Hogan and basically yeah. said announcers don't get royalties where other ones did. I think like Roddy. Well, Biden he got did. it. So he, I think he settled for a million. It was a. I remember the actual figure was like close to the actual figure. It was like nine hundred thousand dollars, close to a million. Yeah. One lump sum, <laughs> tax free. <laughs> tax free, and uh, the and the lawyers' fees get paid as well. Good result. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm, uh, and then Jesse got into politics right after that. 
<laughs> ah, he was the uh, was he the mayor of Brooklyn Park? And then he something? became he was the mayor's bum fucked uh, <laughs> Minnesota. <laughs> But then he became the governor. Yeah. And the whole thing with politics, you know, people wonder how Donald Trump could be such a good president, but it's all about the people you hire around you. He's a good businessman, Donald Trump. And I love Trump. I hate fucking Biden. But anyway, Jesse told me the story that you have all these people around you and you, they're advisors. And that's how you learn to do the shit. And he was a Republican, and it was it was great. Would you vote for Jesse if he ran, even as an independent? Yes, as long as he didn't go Democratic. I hate Democrats. Who's laughing in the background there? That, that's Moose. That was it. <laughs> that's Chris Hughes. Moose, I call him Chris Bulldog, because he had this big, huge bull. What was the Bulldog's name? Frankie. Frankie. Love the Bulldog. <laughs> we will uh, we will move on from the political talk. Uh, H has yeah, wrote in. Fuck Biden. I hate his guts. Dude, everyone I work with is a Republican, it seems, as well. Like, Dutch is a Republican, or, or close enough to it. Uh, I'm yeah. going to ask this one. H writes in, I read in a 1986... Wrestling Observer recently that there were rumours that you were preparing to leave the WWF to join Crockett and become part of the Four Horsemen. Were these rumours true? Absolutely. Really? Because I've never heard this. Well, it came out of Dallas office where the and where TBS were in Atlanta, but they actually moved the office to you know TBS, WCW, whatever. They moved it to Dallas for a while because they, they wanted to go world or world. They want a big expansion like Vince is doing, right? And they called me up. Jim Ross says, "Well, they they would like." You. And, and I think who somebody else got on the phone, JJ Dillon. But the, the main guy, I think I talked to both of them. But Jim Ross was the one that reached out to me and said that uh, they want. They want you to be one of the four horsemen, and they want to turn Barry Wyndham babyface, okay? Mm -hmm. So I was going to come into a beautiful spot, nice guarantee. And so I actually flew to Dallas to talk to him, and then it was all, you know, pretty much set. I had a good guarantee, but I didn't sign it yet. I wanted to, uh, you know, meet with Vince about it. There was no meeting with Vince about it. I, I showed up in, uh, and me and Dino was a new dream team. And, and I was somehow I leaked out that I was over there, but shit, you know, telephone, uh, there's telephone, telegraph and tell a wrestler. It gets out. Right. And, uh, so I showed up in the garden and me and Dino, the new dream team, uh, the new nightmare team, <laughs> Uh, we went out and wrestled the killer bees, and they they wanted us to do the job, and and I didn't like that. And but I went out and did the job anyway. Did some goofy fucking. I had one of them in the figure four, and the other guy jumped off the top and rolled me up. I got on an airplane and flew home, and I quit. And but you know who was on this People Express flight at midnight going from. Newark back to Tampa was Hulk Hogan, and we were the only two on the airplane. But I was in the back hiding. <laughs> <laughs> but as soon as I got home, Vince called me, and we were on the phone for four hours, and he ruined my trip to WCW <laughs> and talked me into coming back. And then he fucked me about seven months later. And wanted me to do a big job for Earthquake at WrestleMania 7, and I did it, but then I fucking quit. <laughs> so, and Donald back Trump to you, Vince. <laughs> I'm still around, and you can't put me down. But you know what? He ends up bringing me back in 2004 and puts me in the Hall of Fame. He's strange. Mm. Did it annoy you that um, you had to do the job for Earthquake in front of Donald Trump at ringside? Yeah, I really did. And my wife was there. And she got pissed. 
And in hindsight, I should have just fucking walked out. I didn't need the money back then. I said, hey, Trump, come on, let's have a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and, he, and Trump told Julie, he said, you're beautiful. He said, you have beautiful feet because she had these shoes on. And um, so I, I love Donald Trump. Uh, well, but I could have done without doing that, you know, earthquake, nice guy and everything, but he's a big fat blob and God bless him. He died, but he was still a big fat blob. And I had, I, I did the job for him. I'm trying to think. And Jimmy Hart, my manager, my favorite manager was there, but he distracted me and gave me a little a way out. Should have never been booked because I watched that match. It's disgusting. And, he was so much bigger than me, you know. Mm. Even though he's a big fat motherfucker. <laughs> with with uh, w- with that being said, I'm trying to think of the other celebrities as well. There was Henry Winkler that year, I think. That wasn't the one yeah. with Willie Nelson, was it? Was that the one that Willie Nelson well, was at? Or was that the year before? Well, I, you know who you know who was at ringside when I went out. No, go on. And, and getting ready to get in the ring was Gene Hackman. You know who Gene yeah, Hackman is? Yeah, of course I do. And he gets up and he goes, go get him, Greg. Go. I said, oh, Christ, you know who I am? He said, Gene Hackman. I shook his hand. Then I got in and did the job. You know. <laughs> there was a lot of celebrities there. Yeah. It was Hollywood. What the fuck, yeah. you know? That was, uh, do you know, that was the event that wasn't it originally to be like a 100,000 seat. Yeah, it was out- supposed to be at the... Uh, the original Coliseum is still standing, uh, Memorial Coliseum in, in California, and it got that big, nice looking. I think they had the Olympics there one time. Mm. It's a real nice uh, Coliseum, and they were supposed to have it outdoors. And Sergeant Slaughter was the main event, and they had all this heat going out about Iran and Saddam Hussein and all that. And so the Vince got paranoid, thought we might get bombed in there <laughs> so we we they put it in the sports arena you know did you did you buy That's the, the truth, explanation though. did you buy that explanation because i because there's two stories there's the one that was well, like what's the other one they couldn't they, what was the other one they couldn't sell enough tickets yeah that that was the other theory i don't know i don't know uh which one you believed ah uh, it didn't matter fuck <laughs> but a lot of it was on you uh youtube uh, cable back then, so um, I think the buys were really good. Maybe that it probably was something to do with that Coliseum, but they used the uh, they were scared of Saddam Hussein, you know. <laughs> I, I love that that was the only WrestleMania that was moved because they were scared like a sniper would turn up and sh- you know, like um, yeah. what's, what's that Frank Sinatra film? The um, where he's hit- <laughs> you know what I mean? I can't think of the yeah. Yeah, it's going to bug me now. I'll I'll, uh, yeah. I'll I'll move on to the next question. Uh, Tiff says, "Could you ask Greg this? Was it true that Hulk Hogan once claimed that? Well, he could claim anything, so it might be true. Uh, but Hulk Hogan once claimed that he had been offered and turned down a Legends match with you at WrestleMania 22 at, in 2006." That son of a bitch. <laughs> I don't know if there's. I heard I've heard that rumor. You know, the rumors start like that, and they almost they get real. Could be real. That son of a bitch. <laughs> he didn't want to work with me. I hit him too hard. Have you heard that? Before? That would have been great. You know, yeah. a legends match. Yeah. You know what though? Uh, yeah, it could be true. Mm. With with so many of Hulk Hogan's claims, it it, it might be true. You never quite know. Well, hey, I, I put Greg's Valentine's name next to Hulk Hogan. I'll take the <laughs> reflection because he's still up there, right? He's the man. And then I get some of that magic angel dust from him being associated with Hulk Hogan. I'll take it. It's true. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's going to be the headline. It's true. Greg says it's true. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to yeah. ask you one more question, Greg. Then we're going to have a little break, and I'll uh, give you a couple of minutes. Um, I believe you're in the WWF at the time in 1984. I think I've asked you round about this before, but what was your reaction when Vince 
bought the controlling interest in Georgia Championship Wrestling? Well, so I was still working with Vince, uh, and uh, I think I was working with Steamboat somewhere all around the place. And we show all of a sudden I get a, a booking t- said to go to go to Atlanta and go to WTBS Studios for wrestling, the wrestling show on TBS. And I go, wow. And then now I'm up, I'm down there at WCW, uh, but it's taken over supposedly by Vince, but it's still WCW. Um, and I'm wrestling on the show, you know. And um, what else was the question there? I suppose it's more just your reaction and how, I don't know. Did you? I couldn't did... believe it. So I didn't even know why I was going Going there, I just got a ticket. Say, hey, go here, <laughs> and and I've been. To, I'd never been to WCW before. I don't think. Uh, the, Not even. I I did a little stint after I left Vince, but never before. So um, maybe when I was in for working for Crockett, but uh, yeah. So I think I worked with Steamboat on it on TV, and then some other guys, and uh, it was it was a takeover. Do you um do you remember Jim? Because Jim Crockett was doing the same thing. He was trying to go national. Bill Watts was trying to go national. Vince McMahon pretty much already was national by you know eighty five. Did you at the time know that the business was going through a really seismic change, or were you just on the road on the you know doing the grind so much that you didn't quite notice how big of a deal it was? Well, I went and had a I made an appointment with Vince to ask him about it. I says, hey. I'm working against all these guys that I made money and and they're everybody's saying we're taking their territory over. And so Vince was buying TV all over the place. Right. And he made some kind of deal that after the ratings were good, then he made his money back from it. Right. And, uh, but he paid to have TV in Dallas and Tampa and Miami, all these different LA and everywhere. So I went to Vince and I go, I, what are you doing? You know, I, I'm working against these guys that I worked and made money for. And, and what's the deal? And he goes, well, you know, Greg, uh, we got to do it like this because we're going worldwide and nationwide and I need to put my product out there. So, you know, I didn't have another question for, for that, you know. He says, but you got, you're good. Just stay here with me. And I go, I will. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get a $92,000 check and then, uh, yeah, Absolutely. That's fine. yeah. And then we're wrestling all over the frigging place and the money is awesome. So yeah. it, it was good. What are fans and specifically the wrestlers missing, uh, now that the territory days have gone completely? What, what's been lost forever? How to work. The art of working and selling and throwing a punch. Some of the guys still have it, but uh, the timing's not there. You need to make it look real. The art of making it real and look real and entertaining, except for some exceptions and for the big big shows like WrestleMania and stuff. That art has, and you need to get it back. Mm. It's gone right now. So why would? So I'm presuming you're going to tell me that the territories were better. So why were the territories better for training people? Uh, well, to tell you, you know, I'm not saying Vince when going nationwide that was perfect, but he got all these guys from the territories, right? So. The, the reason territories were better because they all had separate TVs and you could go in there and you say, well, I'm a star now, but I'm going to go back and return the favor and drop these titles of these guys. Cause I'm going on to another place. So it didn't follow you around. You could put people over, but you could go somewhere else and be a star over there. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So that you, but when it became nationwide, you couldn't do that. You had two different places to go. You had 
WCW or WWF. So is it just too easy to wear out your welcome now? Because everything's national. Yeah, yeah. You got to take care of yourself on TV unless you want to do independence. And and I did a little bit of that. But for the guys coming up now, you know, I guess that's either got a job with uh, AEW or uh, WWE, but they, they give out good contracts. And the guys are spoiled now. Shit. <laughs> Enjoy it, man. We paved the way for you. Christ. Yeah. What's paying your dues mean to you? Uh, like I did. Uh, wrestling for five years and looking for that good first good payday. <laughs> <laughs> paying your dues. Uh, getting potatoes, learning how to work, driving 500 miles a night. Uh, that's paying your dues. Not getting on an airplane, just drive, 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 drive. You know? Hello, everybody. Right, so we had a bit of a break there, and in the interim period, Greg showed me a bit of merchandise he's got going with Pro Wrestling Tees, is it? Yeah, out of Chicago. So it's the micro uh, brawlers. Right. Go on, turn it around. Let's Let's see the figure. Sweet. I didn't. I like it. You know, I got the I got the hammer robe and the yellow boots, the yellow hair, and my big blue eyes. <laughs> Do you know that reminds me of a story? So obviously, I'm sorry we're going back to the WWF mid '80s again. But do you remember when Sergeant Slaughter did his? Uh, he had his own figure, but it wasn't with the WWF. It was with GI Joe. Do you remember the fallout from that? Yeah, but now he's back on some kind of legends contract too. So, but I remember when he was going. I think, I think he told me the story is really complicated. I think Vince just let him do what he wanted to do, and uh, he. I guess Vince caved that one time. Sergeant Slaughter's good businessman, you know. Do you think he? Uh, and carry go on. ahead. No, no, sorry, carry on. No, he's probably other than. There's Hulk Hogan, and all these people would love to have him anywhere he wants to go and sign autographs. And then there's Sergeant Slaughter, you know, so that's top echelon. That's that's where he's at, mm. you know. Greg, I'm going to do Let's just let those, guys, let those guys do what they want to do, like The Undertaker. It's just certain names. Ooh. They can just print money. I know you were joking off air with me saying, I'll sell you one of these figures signed for $1,000. But, you know, The Undertaker, if he signs a doll or something like that, then it becomes worth like $1,000. It's scary how much value just a bit of ink can make to, uh, yeah. to a product. And, and and it doesn't go down. It keeps going up. Yeah. Good investment. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to play a game with you now, Greg. It's called Name Association. Now, I'm going to give you a sentence, a description, and I would like you to give me the first name that comes into your mind when I say it. And the first one is the funniest person in the locker room. And it can be any locker room ever. Uh, Funniest person. Wow. That's a tough one. Um... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is a tough one, apparently. You know what, though? This is, like, way off base, but to me, the funniest person in the locker room was uh, Honky Tonk Man and uh, Chief J. Strombo. Mm. And and uh, Bret Hart. Because Bret Hart would draw cartoons on the blackboard when we were all bored about <laughs> Virgil. And, and it would have his a picture of Virgil's penis going down from his drawers and going out the hallway and going down. He had this all drawn up the hallway, and there Chief Strombo would be standing there with 
his hand on his hips. It was just like, oh my God. <laughs> Do you understand? Can you picture that? Yes, <laughs> I can. I can. Was were the rumors about Virgil true? What's up? Well, the, he's and got he a dick a big... that goes down the hallway. Yeah, it is true. Yes, unfortunately, I picked him up this weekend and had to see that it's all true. Did you still look at it? I, I couldn't help it. He was standing there in the doorway. Oh, nude? Yeah. Yeah. I thought maybe asking ask to pull his pants down. <laughs> is it still long, though? Yeah, it's scary. It's, yeah. it's scary, yeah. It always was, you know. <laughs> Are we talking Robert Fuller size here, or...? Bir Virgil still got the long gone. But, uh, so Bret Hart would draw these cartoons. He was a hell of a cartoon guy. And he'd draw them on a blackboard and he'd have the, the weenie going down the hallway and then coming after and there'd be Chief standing there like this at the end. And Chief would come in and look at the <laughs> look at the blackboard and so he'd shake his head and walk away. But everybody just <laughs> laughed. He always was drawing pictures. Thank God he didn't draw a picture of me, but it was always Virgil's dick going somewhere and then picture of the Chiefs standing there. <laughs> <laughs> Strombo was, uh, he was, he had a hell of a personality. And when he became an agent, he was just, oh, and he hated the honky tonk man. And honky hated him. <laughs> and, uh, oh my God. What was the what was the animosity about then? Do you think? Uh he just didn't fucking like Honky Tonk Man. You know, not many people liked him. I always liked him, uh, but now people like him, I guess. But he's so funny. Someone was talking to me the other day. Said, "I just can't get along with that guy." Just well, I was just around him, and he was a sweetheart. So he has one side. So I was in L.A. with him, right, for this big, huge uh, WrestleCon and WrestleMania, all that shit, last month. And he actually came up to me, and he gave me a bunch of our Rhythm of Blues 8 by 10s and maybe 50 of them, and he signed them for me. So he said, he'd take them out and sell. And I never do that. Um, I understand Beefcake used to have pictures of him and Hulk, and he'd sign Hulk's name. <laughs> but at least honky came over and actually gave him his his autograph and everybody's autograph you, you could tell it's a phony and honky's just see two h's and it's not that good bruce speed has got a great autograph i have a great one um so who's who's is the easiest to forge then was it what was it hulk Hogan? Uh, was just hh yeah, I I I hate to think that forgery is going on, but um, you know, I, Beefcake don't do that anymore. No, good. No, I and I don't even know if he did it. It could have been just a rumor. Um, well, because him and Hogan, him and Hogan were they're not so much good friends now, but uh, but you know they, they'll kiss and make up eventually. No, I'm sure they will. Uh, we'll move on then. The <laughs> last man standing at the bar. Who was the uh, who partied hard hardest into the night? Yes, Flair. Woo! <laughs> Woo! I'm the sixty minute man. Woo! <laughs> did you ever see? Do you ever see him? Dump I've been married the drinks? fifty times. Woo! I'm the Mickey Rooney of wrestling. You know who Mickey Rooney is. You're too young for No, that. I know exactly who he is. He was a the very short, fucker. very yeah, very he, short actor, he, child actor. He got married like twelve times. <laughs> Jar Jar Gabor as well. What she yeah, did about? Yeah, she does married it? a lot of times, right? Yeah. Ah, get it, Rick. Get that one out of here. <laughs> With... You ever see the show Green Acres over there? No, I've never seen it. I've never seen it. <laughs> Green Acres is a place for me. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. yeah. Arnold Zippel was big. Yeah, and, and there was Arnold Zippel the pig. Who was the guy that sang the song? Uh, Green Acres, the blonde guy. Uh, he played her husband. 
And she goes, Times Square, I got to get out of hell. She, she wanted to be in New York and he wanted to be on Green Acres. And, and they had, I thought the pig was named Arnold. Arnold Zippel. Arnold Zippel. Okay. I got part of it right. I'm, I'm looking at the cast now. Tom Lester, Eddie Albert, Eva Gabor. Pat Eddie Albert. He was. There you go. Eva. Nobody named Eva. It was Eva. Uh, yes. Ava Gabor. No, it says, okay. uh, it says, yeah, Ava Gabor, sorry, yeah. Well, they all married about okay. 78 times. That's your times. accent, that freaking accent. Mm, sorry. <laughs> you got, yeah, you got to get used to it. I, I, I've tried an American accent. It I love work. the Beatles, and I love your accent, okay? I can't wait to meet you. <laughs> well, I, 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 do you want me to do a Beatles accent for you? Yeah. Okay, I can't do one. Uh, put myself do John on the, Lennon. Um, no, I've put myself on the spot there. I won't do it. You can't do it. You do you know, if I wasn't recording myself doing it, I could probably pull up with one. But I could do a Paul McCartney. Like, oh, hello there. How are you? My name's Paul. Ooh. That's you got it. Yeah, that's sort of a Paul McCartney. Yeah. Okay, that's perfect. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that there. I'll leave that one. Okay. There. Yeah. Stop. Stop on a high note. Yeah. yeah smelliest wrestler. Wow. Oh, um, uh, you know, I hate to say this, but there was this black wrestler, and his name was Skip Young. And I wrestled him in tag matches only in the Carolinas. He was a black guy, right? Mm -hmm. And he just, I'm not saying, I'm not being racist or anything, because I wrestled a lot of black guys and they smelled really good. <laughs> so it was, his name was Skip Young. And I'm wrestling one time and, and uh, his eyeball, eyeball fell out. And I'm looking at him and he didn't know his eyeball was gone. And I'm looking at a socket like this and there's no eye in there. And I go, your eye fell, and he, he got out of the ring, and he jumped out, and he grabbed his eyeball, and he got back into the ring. And now, now this is a true story. I'm not making this up, and I'm just waiting for him. I might even open the ropes for him. So he comes in, and he puts his eye in, and the only thing is it's in backwards. Oh, my God. So it's just a wide eye. Oh. But now I'm smelling this, right? I don't know what he did. Sprayed something to, on his eye socket to put it back in. It, it really smelled bad. So that's my story about Skip Young and the smelliest wrestler I ever smelled. So, so you were smelling the inside of his head then, or, or the stuff that he sprayed? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just... Wanted to put that story in there because it's a good way to get it out. But I, <laughs> I do remember, I do remember a really bad odor. Jeez, uh, of so all I'm going to right. give. He's passed away, and uh, he's a great guy, and I hope he's in heaven. What a nice guy, Skip Young. We'll uh, we'll move on. Most dangerous situation you ever found yourself in. This could be wrestling in the locker room in the bar afterwards, the most dangerous situation you found yourself in? Ah, uh, wow. I'm going to have to ponder on that. Go to another question. Okay. Uh, the stiffest wrestler you ever worked with? Ah, uh, Haku. Really? Yeah, Haku. Wahoo McDaniel. More Haku just once in a while, but Wahoo McDaniel, I had a Vicious feud with him in the Carolinas, and he beat the hell out of me every night till I finally got mad and hauled out. I mean, I'd be, you know, I'd chop him back, right? But one night I just had fucking had it. And uh, he was all coked up, and he didn't know where he was throwing the chops. And so I, I just hauled up and hit him as hard as I could, like right in the face. And he went down on one knee and shook his head. And that's when I realized, hey, I got a pretty good punch. <laughs> <laughs> but I loved Long McDaniel, and he came up and uh, 
complimented me and says, you're one tough son of a bitch. So, but then we're right back in the next few days where he's beating the shit out of me again, you know, but I had the respect, mm. Brian. Uh, uh, he this- always respected me. He just, I, I guess I like being beat up for a while. You know, I got tired <laughs> of it. My chest would be bleeding every night. And George Scott says, well, here's how you heal that. You just take rubbing alcohol and throw it on all them cuts. And it hurt like fucking hell. But you know what? Then I had big calluses on my, and still to this day, I got the roughest chest in the world. (laughs) The scars are still there. And And it kills pink eye as well, I believe. Alcohol. No, beer does. Oh, beer does, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, it's a call back from the la- to the last interview. We'll, we'll bring you up. Did yeah, Wahoo yeah. McDaniel? Did he spray paint his head? Yes. Yes. Whatever that stuff was, uh, it was shoe polish. That's what it was. Spray shoe polish, but it was just like on the top. So he would spray that, and it wasn't bad looking, you know. Mm-hmm. Did you ever like had little hairs in it? You know. Did you ever like headlock him, and then like you'd have like a big black like ring around your arm? Uh, I think it pretty much stayed in pretty good. I think Pedro Morales did the same thing. Oh, did he really? And it's it stayed in, it stayed in, just covered up because when you get into the ring lights, like right now, if I was at a bald spot, you could probably see it. But those guys had dark hair, hard to cover up a bald spot, and uh, so they'd spray. It did a pretty good job. Do you, right, this is okay. This is not on the list. I just wanted to ask this: Is have you ever wrestled somebody who was wearing a wig? Because I know, like, there was Bruno wore a wig for a while. Like, um, yeah, I wrestled Bruno. Yeah, and it was on Channel Eleven in Pittsburgh. That was the big uh, Channel Eleven, Pittsburgh. That's where the wrestling came out. That was the, the biggest station in Pittsburgh, and I think it was an independent, or it could have been ABC One. Anyways, on top of the hill, we used to drive up there and we'd do wrestling on top of the hill. And they'd have a few fans in there. But what was really odd was when I'd, I'd be in the, in the ring and I'd look and it looked like people, but they were painted on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> but there was people in there, right? And they, it all echoed real good. But this one wall was all painted people painted on the wall and Bruno came up to me and I didn't care much for Bruno. I know he's a fucking legend and everything. And, and, uh, but my dad didn't like him. So I, I wrestled him a couple times and the garden, Madison square garden and the other garden, uh, um, Boston. And, uh, he just wanted to hold me down in a headlock all the time. I I didn't appreciate that. But uh, so I'm, I'm getting ready to wrestle him on television. He goes, Greg, I I I got you, and I I want you because I know how stiff you are, <laughs> and I got this wig on, and I want to I want to wear it in the ring, and and uh, eventually he just ended up shaving his head anyway, right? But I want to see, I want you to give me a bunch of those elbows on top of the head and see if that if that uh, wig will stay on. So we got in there and he said, come on, hit me, hit me. I said, oh, finally I get to hit this motherfucker. <laughs> bam, bam. I didn't like Bruno. Fuck him. I'm sorry, Bruno. At least I'm looking up, right? Ah, uh, fuck him. So, so it was really funny. He starts sweating. He said, come on, kid, keep coming. And He's starting to sweat, and now it's starting to look like a brick on top of his head. Ah. <laughs> and it's running down the side. So he gets back in the t- How I look, how I look, I go, oh, I look good. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't yeah, have a, ba- he did, he didn't that, have a backup That's a wig. long answer to your question, but we're filling up time here. It, it was a great and, answer. It was a great answer. Okay, he did, he yeah. didn't have a backup. I'm wig very then. dramatic with my shit, you know, but it's all true. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna get. I'll get. Well, I've got a million here. I could give you. Let's see the best ones. Uh, the loudest spot caller. <laughs> uh, 
Hey, my ear's right here. You don't have to yell it across the <laughs> ring. Um, now it's hard for me to answer that one. Uh, most of the guys I've worked with you, uh, I usually call it the spots. And uh, so if anybody was noisy, it'd be me, but I covered it up, you know. Mm. Most of the guys would learn how to, you know, but I, most of the guys would learn how to cover and run their mouth, like, you know, so you can't tell they're talking. People look for the lips to move, not so much. They can't really hear what you're saying up there. Let us, you're yelling it out like that. But I've done that too. I say, hey, motherfucker, get out of the ring, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it's easy to just, you know, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. uh, one tackle, drop down, hip toss me, arm drag me, and yell that real loud. <laughs> I never call spots. No, than. I remember wrestling one guy. I remember who it was. He goes, well, say something. I go, I don't say things. <laughs> Sell this motherfucker. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Sell this fucking chop. All right. Here. Uh, right, everyone. I didn't have to tell them to sell it because it hurt. Oh, they'll sell it. Yeah. Whether they want to or not. I love beating people up. And it says that on one of my trading cards. I go, I never said that. The guy, I must, they, they must have had a premonition that I really did enjoy it. I do enjoy beating people up. Who did you I enjoy do. beating up the most? Who's the one that you just love to lay in with? Beefcake. <laughs> what was he signing your signatures? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and for, for marrying that fucking that he married. <laughs> Missy <laughs> Beefcake. And you don't have to cut that out either. She's a fucking c <laughs> <laughs> And I'm laughing, but it's the truth. <laughs> On the and, and 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 he lets he lets that fucking c tell him what to do. What the fuck? <laughs> I'll, I'm, I am keeping that in as well, definitely. Uh, I'll, I'll give you two more. I'll give you no, two you more. No, you got to. Oh, I'll, oh, of course I'll keep it on. I'll keep it on. I, I I'll, want I'll, my I'll... wife to see it too. Oh, do you? <laughs> I'll get a lot of points. But no, she she hates that fucking <laughs> So do I. <laughs> and there's you... not a better word to describe her, or you could call her Missy Beefcake the fucking you know, or call it like Greg the Hammer Valentine. It'd be Missy fucking beefcake. Uh, Missy fucking beefcake. <laughs> <laughs> or Missy the beefcake. Yeah, that runs together better. <laughs> My Put her in the out. fucking ring with that big fucking belly she's got. <laughs> having, having said that, I'm going to... Just totally move off uh, Brutus's wife, and <laughs> and uh, I give you two more. Uh, you've answered this, I'm sure a million. I'm sure you've answered this a million times. I'll, I'll give you a second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Toughest badass, apart from Haku. Haku, besides Haku. Yeah, because everyone oh. says Haku. Yeah. Who does? Everybody. Everybody says but, Haku. But you want another one? Yeah, give us a second place. Danny Spivey. Oh, did you see the fights with no, Adrian? No, but I heard about it. It was in Green Bay, Wisconsin, or one of those places. And uh, I I had went home because uh, my wife was sick or something. I had to go home for a few days. I was supposed to actually uh, be on that show. And... Uh, or maybe I was going to work with Adrian. I don't know, but ended up putting Dan Spivey in there with Adrian. And Adrian went to uh, leg dive him and do all this wrestling shit. And Danny just blocked it and fucking punched him out. And he went for it again. He punched him out again. And then they went back to the dressing room. Uh, the match was over. Like, I guess he knocked him out in the ring, but he got up. And then... They went back, they carried on into the dressing room, and Adrian comes in to Danny. He goes, hey, what the fuck are you doing out there to me? And then he went to leg dive Danny, and Danny punched him again and punched him again and punched him again. 
Now his fucking head's like a fucking alien. It's <laughs> out like this. And uh, so I wasn't there. I showed up in Chicago the next day. And I was wrestling, I guess, uh, me and Brutus were wrestling somebody. I, I had been sick, right? So I showed up, and I, I looked, and there was this alien sitting in the dressing room. There's a big fucking round head in the dressing room, and it was Adrian. I didn't even fucking recognize him. I never seen anybody beat up this fucking bad. He looked like an alien or worse. And he showed up because he was in the main event against Hogan, I think. And yeah, and uh, they wouldn't let him go on. And somebody else showed up and, and wrestled Hogan, but they wouldn't. In fact, I think they sent him home and fired him or something. I don't know. Jesus. What? Yeah, they're brutal. I mean, if you can't. <laughs> After that, Adrian, I think Adrian did leave the WWF and then he went to uh, Japan and made all that money and then he flew back and they always pay cash when you're in Japan and you you know you got all this money 20 30 40 thousand dollars cash hundred dollar bills American and he got in uh, he flew right into uh, New Brunswick or somewhere in Newfoundland and got in a in a big van with the two Kelly twins and somebody else and the referee and they're driving and he's got all that money on him and they hit a moose or dodge dodged the moose moose got out in the road so they dodged the moose and they went down this big ravine in a bunch of rocks and shit right into the river and everybody went forward and uh, uh everybody died on there mm. the bear man who who brought the bear around the bear wasn't with him but he died dave mckigney uh one of the referees survived, um, and somebody else survived, but Adrian was dead, and uh, they stole all that money from him. Uh, the Kelly twins were alive, but I think one of the referees stole the money. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm so just, oh, really? Yeah, so it was like 30, 40 grand. Adrian's dead. He just took the money, I'm... and... Uh, and then he went back to the hotel or whatever. And then the wife lived out in Bakersfield and she called Canadian authorities and said that he had $40,000 cash on him. And so they tracked it down and they got, they arrested the guy, probably let him go because he's a fucking Canadian, but <laughs> uh I'm, I'm looking she got at, her money back. Yeah, she I'm, got her money back. I'm looking at the names: Mike Kelly, Pat Kelly, and Dave McKigney. Yeah, yes, they died, right? Uh, I could probably tell you who died and who didn't, but uh, I'd have to read it. I think massive they, article. Uh, Dave McKigney died. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Uh, no, I, I, I'd have to read like a massive article to find out who died. I'll, I'll leave it there. But um, you, you mentioned that backstage fight you didn't see. What was the most memorable backstage fight you did see? Uh no, I didn't see too much. Um, I saw Tito come in and grab Brutus by the neck. And he said, you motherfucker. Blah, 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 blah. And then Brutus, like, <laughs> it was a tag match that we had against Tito and Steamboat or Tito and, who was the strike for us? I can't remember. Uh, Rick Martel. Rick Martel. But anyway, Beefcake. Uh, snubbed him in a ring or something. I don't know what happened. Mm. And, uh, you know, Tito's a tough guy. He scared the fuck out of Beefcake. I go, Tito, Tito, don't hurt him. I did. I had to say that. Oh, did you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't hurt him too bad. Give him a give him the, something. The Bulldogs, used, the Bulldogs used to beat Beefcake all the time, too. In fact, I remember one time Beefcake came to the corner and he's crying. He said, they beat the fuck out of me. I'm serious. I'm not making this up. They beat the fuck out of me, man. I can't fucking see. So I got in the fucking ring. I said, you motherfuckers. I fucking beat both of them in the fucking head. I said, you're fucking hurting my partner. You're fucking the matchup. I'm not saying I could beat both of them, but, you know. 
Oh, hang on. This was I during the match. Up, I stuck up for Beefcake. What? You're fucking ruining the match. And he's crying over there? What the fuck? <laughs> I thought that was in the locker room. He did that during the match. Yeah. Oh. But that was just that one time that I don't think they beat him up. They just, he, well, maybe they did. You know, they were just stiff. They they didn't throw punches for real. I mean, it was still working punches, but they were tough guys, you know. Mm. When I had Brutus on, he told me that he was not the biggest fan, and neither were you, of the Rockers, Sean and Marty. Is that right? No, and I'm not going to, I'm not, I want to take that back about Brutus, but they, I felt bad for him and I stuck up for him, but I don't think Brutus is as tough as I am, but I don't think Brutus is a coward either. And I just wish he'd get away from that fucking. (laughs) So anyway, what was it? What was the question? Uh, I don't, Brutus said that you weren't a fan and he wasn't a fan of Marty and Sean, the rockers at the time. Is that true, or no. is that just Brutus? No, no, that's true. I I like Marty though, but I didn't like Sean. And then when we, when we wrestled him, I would always fucking lay him in. I wouldn't sell shit. I chopped the fuck out of him. Fuck Shawn Michaels. I like him better now because his face is lopsided, and and it's like someone. Super kicked him with his own punch in his face, so it's all fucking caved in. But he's got a fucking job. He's taking being taken care of. He works down at the performance center. But he's never one of my favorite people. But uh, I guess he's okay now. He came up and said hi to me, you know. So was he? Is he too pretty, or was he too pretty back he's then? He's not pretty anymore. No, his fucking head's caved in. He looks like. Uh, Who's that one-eyed guy like? Uh, uh, who is that? Uh, something young. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> with, the, with the smelly eye socket. Elephant man or something. No, that's not. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, no, I couldn't resist. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I love these interviews. <laughs> I, it's not like I, at least I'm not holding back. But. Oh, God, no. It's, <laughs> it, that's what I love. That's what I love about like the old guard of wrestling. You just say what's on your mind. Cause like if someone's younger, you're like more yeah. media savvy. And I, th- I think everyone's just like a bit too worried about their position. I have no position. I have a big fucking name and that's it. And a big contract. And I, got, I got nice guys. I got a good royalty contract, and I have guys that are friends that book me and take care of me. And uh, I don't wrestle anymore, but I just love being out here, and and uh, and I'm happy. I'm good happy. Man. I don't have to be as rich as Ric Flair, you know. I don't have to be that far. Well, Ric right? Flair, he hasn't got two pennies <laughs> to rub together. <laughs> I don't have to be as rich as The Rock. There okay? you go. Yeah. And he's spending all his fucking money anyway around that fucking football or whatever. <laughs> we bought it for cheap, I think, anyway. Yeah. Like him and his wife and someone else, they bought it for cheap. Uh, just just because you mentioned Flair, um, who did the figure four first and who did the uh, flop first? Okay, I was a flop first and I was a figure four first. I came back from WWF when I first went under in 79. I came back. And they said, well, he didn't want me to use the figure four. And he goes, why not? He said, Ric Flair is using that. So what the fuck? That's my fucking hole. But anyway, I laid off. I did something else for a while. <laughs> and I did that ankle thing where I broke Wahoo's leg just going back. I don't need a fucking hole. But then eventually I started using it there anyway. So, so hang on. So we've got the chops. We've got figure four. We've got the right. flop forward. We've got the blonde hair. So, so, so now you tell the fans, go look at a Ric Flair match and see where he takes that, where he lands on his face, but he kicks the leg up, right? Mm-hmm. Now I do it, and I'm like a fucking tree faller. 
And I don't break nothing with a fucking knee or nothing. It's just straight down. I have the best flop. Who uh, who did the flop first in wrestling, do you know? Or, or would you say you're the originator? I might have been the originator, but I think Johnny Valentine uh, might have done that. But he did, his, he, he did his in a bar. He would fall flat on his face in a bar just to freak people out right on the concrete or the linoleum floor or wood floor. But then he kind of carried it into the ring because he always taught me when you're taking punches, don't fall backwards and don't look real. Fall forward. So I'm watching some of his matches. So I just put it in the, I'd have a guy be beat me, beat me, beat me, and then bam, and then I go like, and then fall flat on my face. Mm. So there was a buildup to it. Rick just threw it in there. Now, Rick used to do the the twirl or, or whatever, the thing in the, in the corner and then come out on top, and he did all that. I, I couldn't do that. So Rick was great, too, in his own right. I'm going to give you a fan question now. I've got a million of them. I'm just asking my own questions. I normally do. Uh, Dwayne Duncan asks, which wrestler in WWE was, in your opinion, overrated and didn't deserve to be pushed? And who did you think was underrated and deserved a push but didn't get one? So overrated and underrated. Uh, well, that's a tough question. Um, I could put a lot of guys on there that, that were overrated. <laughs> All those guys, all those fucking muscles, you know? Mm. You know, all those bodybuilders, they can't fucking work. Shit. They're, you know, my dad used to teach me, uh, he goes, you do too many weights and then you get all stiff arm. He says, it's, you throw a good working punch, it's like throwing a baseball. You know, you want to throw it. And I think I lost you. Are you there? Uh, I'm still Low here. battery. Oh. No, I can't see him anymore. One sec. It was like uh, throwing so a baseball. It's like throwing yeah. throwing a baseball, right? Yeah. You keep your arm loose, and you can throw a good punch in there without knocking a guy's head off, but it looks realistic, you know? And uh, a lot of guys, have, if you have those big arms and they're heavy and you can't throw a punch, they throw it like this. You know, Jim Nidor couldn't throw a punch. Uh, I don't know. I think Brett Brett Hart could throw a punch, but uh, there was a lot of guys their arms were too big; they couldn't throw a punch. You know? Yeah, Brett always had a weird punch because he always seemed to punch. Uh, yeah, it was almost, like, almost like this. He almost seemed to like like this, the... right? Yeah, yeah. You got to do the overhang and hit right in the air, and it looks like a fucking punch. Another thing is, you know, you see your hand like this, right? Mm -hmm. A closed fist is like this, and you're throwing a punch. This is a real punch, right? But if you say you open your hand like this a little bit, and then all you guys are learning how to wrestle, you see that you don't make a closed fist, but when you go like that, it looks like it's closed, right? So you throw the punch and you can lay it right in, but because your fists ain't closed real hard, it doesn't hurt as bad. You know, it might hurt a little bit, but what the fuck? You can't take a, a little bit of a pain, you're in the wrong fucking business. Mm. Who, uh, who had the best punch for you? Because I always thought Terry Funk's punch was great, but it always looked like he was yes. just hitting you. Yes. Well, yeah, he did hit me. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we used to punch it. We, we did this. We were trying to get this XWF going. Um, and uh, I used to wrestle Terry a lot, and we threw a lot of haymakers, potatoes we call them. Um, but, yeah, his did hurt. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask this so you go to WCW in around 91, 92 somewhere like that so that must mean you have a Jim Hurd story no he wasn't there when I got there oh, he left oh you're joking no I, I didn't ever meet the pizza man was he pizza guy yeah pizza hut executive I heard yeah. About him, yeah. so who who was it then was it um, Kip Fry uh, I don't remember I think Bill Watts came in he was a booker and I had a nice deal going in there and then he came in after I was already there. And uh, actually, Crockett brought me in, and, and we did that thing. But it was like, it wasn't it wasn't good. And Bill Watts was there, and he wanted me to do a job for somebody, Sting or something, on TBS. And I took 
took my boots off and walked out, you know. So <laughs> I usually don't do business like that. Fuck, I ain't putting that fucking jabroni over. You put I'm from New over. York, baby. <laughs> you put earthquake <laughs> over that. <laughs> I'm a star for fun New York. You don't fuck fuck with me, man. <laughs> so I left. I quit. I didn't know that, but they they kept five thousand dollars of my money, motherfuckers. While you left. Problem so with the... They hold me for ransom. You do this job for Sting, woo, whatever his shit was, and we'll give you your five grand. But it's <laughs> fuck, I don't need it. Uh, here's one for you. Old School Pro Wrestling says, uh, ask Greg about an overseas tour in 1993 where he worked some shows with the Ultimate Warrior. The promotion was called WWS or World Wrestling Superstars, whatever it was. Yeah, rumor has yeah it, I remember that. Yeah, rumor yeah. has it that Warrior asked for more money after noticing every show was sold out, which led to all the right. wrestlers getting more money. Is that true? Well, I got more money. He called me into the... It was in Vienna, it was Vienna, Austria, and it was sold out. And I was wrestling Jake, and he was wrestling, I don't know, Hercules or something. So we were the two main events. The Bushwhackers were on that tour. tour. It was a great card. Mm. It was actually all the WWF guys that got let go or what, you know? Our, our deals ran out or whatever. I quit. Um, <clears throat> so he called me in. He goes, you want more money? And I go, fuck yeah, I'd like more money. He goes, well, let's tell them we're not going on until we get more money. Mm. And the guy comes in, he flips, I, I, I can't get you back. This is Austria, or not Australia, but I, this is Vienna, I can't get a bunch of American. He wanted $100 bills, and he freaked out that he left. Now the people are starting to pound the chairs out there. Boom, 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 boom. And they're holding it, because he's holding the whole show up. He wants to, you know, he won't. He got preliminaries that could have went on. You know, the bushwhackers or whatever. And he's holding everything up. He ends up coming back in with suitcases full of hundred dollar bills. <laughs> and uh, so the show went on. And uh, I went out and worked with Jake, and and then we got a lot more money for that one thing. And then we still had more to do. We went up to uh, went up to. Uh, Berlin and all these different shows. It was a hell of a tour. Mm. Yeah, was WWS. That, yeah, was that a common practice for it, like for independent wrestling cards? Would you see the house if it was busy? Would somebody say, "Hey, we're not going on until"? You well, know, I've we... never done that before. No, I mean, this goes to the record, and I've told this story before. I have never held up anybody. I've got mad and walked out. You know, I, but this was the smartest thing I ever did because I got more money and I still went out and wrestled and I tipped my hat to Ultimate Warrior. And, and before I didn't know the guy that well, and my wife liked his wife and, uh, and I wrestled with him in that small tour we had in Florida. Uh, but I, I love the guy now and he made me a lot, twice as much money mm. I walked out with. Was that just for the one event or was that for the entire tour? that you For the entire the tour because they were all connected. Mm. So we just held them up. Uh, I'm yeah. going gonna, gonna to ask you one more question, then we're going to go to the like big finale at the end, and then I will thank you for your time. We'll go as far as uh, Chris tells me I can or the phone battery dies. So wh whatever yeah. whatever stops first. So um, one, In fact, a number of people asked uh, a, an oddly large amount of questions about the Insane Clown Posse. How many times have the Insane Clown Posse booked you? Uh, wow. Uh, a lot of different times. I think four or five times. Mm -hmm. uh, it was first just to wrestle, and they would be like, I went on the, in the ring at 5 o'clock in the morning. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I waited that long, and then they – I went back to the airport and they flew me out. I didn't even, I, I remember taking a shower in the airport just to get back, but it was good money. Mm. But then I started doing the uh, ICP show, Insane Clown Posse show in New York, where I just sat there and talk and watch videos, uh, rock and roll videos, right? Mm -hmm. So I did, did that with those guys and, 
didn't have to wrestle and just, you know, laughed and asked questions and they'd have a picture of my face watching whoever they had up there on the stage. Uh, and they talked over videos like an MTV thing. Mm. Uh, I do a I do a podcast weekly with Dutch Mantel, and he said that when he did the Insane Clown Posse, like the gathering of the Juggalos events, he said he's never seen so many tables just just full of drugs, just ta- just That's like gimmick. True. Yeah, it's like a gimmick table, but like full of gimmicks, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. I stayed away <laughs> from that shit. I had my own drugs. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah. I wrestled with Tito. I wrestled somebody else there on the next one. Then after that, it was all um, it was all interviews at the ICP Theater. That's what it was called. Yeah, and it was on uh, some networks out here, um, Fuse Network, some other ones. F U S E Fuse Network played all over the country, so it was good. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I will sneak in this one quick question. Kevin Kelly, I'm not sure if it's the announcer Kevin Kelly or someone who shares the same name, or maybe it's Nails. Um, if you couldn't have been a professional wrestler, what other job would you have considered doing? I wanted to be a radio DJ. You know, like the real Don Steele or Pat St. John or all these different... I'm I'm a big radio fan. The Wolfman. And, uh, stick, the 60s, Wolfman Jack. Yeah, I'd love to spin. I'd love to spin the records and talk and tell stories. And I would have been that a radio announcer. In fact, I went to Columbia School of Broadcasting uh, before I hooked up with my dad. So I, I was thinking about that before I became a wrestler. But um, wrestling, uh, there was some other guy that used to uh, be a DJ. I think Jerry Lawler. Yeah, mm-hmm. and there's a DJ right now that. Uh, uh, what the hell's his name? I was gonna uh, say Teddy Long. Hillbilly Billy Jim. Hillbilly he's Jim, on yeah. XM radio. Yeah, he's on XM radio country station. Mm. I was gonna say Teddy Long was a DJ back many, many years ago, yeah. I believe the okay. uh, manager referee. Yeah. So that would have been my other that you know, either that or being a logger and splitting wood. That's how I grew up. <laughs> right. In, in our, Seattle, dropping trees down, baby. In our remaining ten or so minutes or however long the camera battery lasts. I am going to do the last bit of the interview. I call it the firing line. All I'm going to do is just fire some names at you. You tell me if I'm sure you'll just say you'll like them for the most part. But uh, if there's a funny little story to add with them, please do. And the first name I'm going to give you is Rocky Johnson. Oh, beautiful person. Uh, I wrestled him as Sweet Daddy C. No, that one is Sweet Ebony Diamonds. Sweet Ebony Diamond, right, because it was a Sweet Daddy C. Sweet Ebony Diamond, I had him in, uh, you know, I had to let him do his thing, you know, and go back and forth, back and forth. But loved the guy. I, every time I saw him, he used to, he said, my hands all messed up. You'll be doing autographs go. My hands all messed up because I worked with Greg so many times, you know, because I was so stiff. He'd show his hand like this. <laughs> Love Rocky Johnson. Okay, next one. Larry Zabisco. I just saw Larry yesterday. Oh, was he there? Yeah, he was. I don't know too much about his wrestling. I guess I wrestled him a couple of times, but as far as a person, he's a genuine person, and he was a great announcer for WCW. Mm-hmm. He was really good. Yeah, Danny Hodge. I only met him one time. Oh, really? Yeah, he was a light heavyweight champion, NWA. Stiff son of a bitch. He was the real deal. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever meet Nelson Royal? Yes, I did. He he lived just north of Charlotte. Mm. But I didn't know these guys. Just a handshake. Yeah. Mike Graham. I knew Mike Graham. He had a short man complex. and But his dad took care of him. And... uh I don't know what happened to him. He went nuts and killed himself. Mm. But so did Eddie Graham, and I guess one of the kids killed themselves too. It, it's a, it's like the Bon Erics; they all kill themselves. Mm. Did did you have Mike as a an agent in WCW? No, no. Did you have Greg Garnier? No. no. 
Oh, you're lucky then, apparently, uh, from what I hear. I'll, I wouldn't like you to want to tell me what to do. <laughs> uh, Dr. D. We've got to have a story about I say, Dr. D. See this? Dr. D? Oh, yeah. I was with him one day. I didn't know the guy that well, but we, he was in WWF, and I just came back from a tour in the Carolinas, and I met him, and we're on a rent-a-car bus, and he's sitting there, and some guy's staring at him. We're going to a rent-a-car. He's getting his own rental car and I'm getting my rental car. We just on a long fucking trip. And some guy's looking at him and David Schultz goes, look at me. What are you looking at? What are you looking at? He's yelling at this guy that we don't even know. Quit looking at me. I'll kick your ass. He went off on this guy. The guy finally just got off the bus and then we all got off the bus. I go, I'm thinking to myself, well, what the fuck was that about? And then eventually he ended up knocking that um, Stasso or whatever out. Mm -hmm. I watched that, too. I was there that day. He knocked the guy out or hit him, slapped him down. Oh, he was a rocket, you know. He was ready to blast off. <laughs> was it Dr. D who, um, I believe this might have been his last day in the WWF, uh, he tried to, like, rush the ring? I don't okay, know I was in L.A. for that. I was in L.A. Oh, for tell, that. Oh, tell me about there. it. Tell me. Yeah, so that could have been WrestleMania 7. I don't know. No, no, this was, this, was a lot of, this was an MTV special in 85, I think, that he tried okay. to rush the ring and they had to carry him out. Like, oh, he was, trying to do, he was trying to do his own. Uh, he was trying to work his own angle. He, he, he went, I can't remember who was in the ring. Could have been Hogan could have been in the ring. But he was going to go out there and get in the ring, and you can't do that. Mm. And Jay Strombo was the agent, and he told the police to tackle him. And they took him down. And I remember I came out. They didn't stop the match. The fans never saw what was going on. I came out to go to the ring to do my match, and he's handcuffed with his, with his arms behind him. He's handcuffed with his face down, and they got him shackled too. <laughs> And then, then I'm watching him drag him out like that. And I went and wrestled. I came back, and he was gone. They had him arrested and threw him out, whatever. I don't think he got arrested. He just threw him out. Mm. Good enough just to get him rid of him. Uh, the next name is Buff Bagwell. Yeah. Um, I wasn't around Buff that much. Uh, every time I worked with him, I'd chop him real hard and I know he hated that <laughs> but uh, he ended up tagging up with uh, Scott Steiner he did pretty good yeah he did yeah. Bobo Brazil I just saw him the other day oh, I just saw him the other day in, in, in LA he was uh, back there doing an interview or uh, doing the, uh, the WrestleCon he looked good he, yes, was, he looked in good shape yes yeah, he got the distinguished silver hair now I didn't notice that, but he had the hat on. Oh, right. Uh, Bobo Brazil. Classic guy. He, I used to wrestle. Uh, I'd wrestle him, and it was like he'd hold me down on his knee. And, <laughs> Come on, kid. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> and I would ride. He'd drive that Lincoln Continental. And he, and he had that big cigar, and uh, he, he let me sit up front with him. He was a good friend of my dad's. They made a lot of money in Washington, D.C. together. Mm. Great man, Bobo Brazil. Ole Anderson. Oh, God. <laughs> I can't say enough good about him or enough bad about him. Ah. <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, Oh God! Big fan. I don't. I, I don't think he ever got in my face one time. Maybe he did. I don't know. I can't remember. Maybe I just mentally blocked it out. But I, uh, Roddy had a good nickname for him. He called him Pig Face, <laughs> and I saw them almost go to punches. So I said, "Well, fuck if Roddy can do that, I can do that." So I refused to do something. I got right in his face, and he just turned on, and walked off, but. His his uh, look and his bite was a lot worse than he actually was. You know, Terry Taylor or his bark. I like Terry Taylor. He was a good partner. 
I actually saw him at WrestleMania. He's got a fucking job in the back. Yeah, yeah. He's like a fuck. He's like a what is it, a cat? You throw it in the air and you land on your feet. <laughs> uh, why should he have that job and not me? <laughs> but I mean, you know, I don't want a fucking job like that. I was going to say you don't want to do the road. traveling now, surely? Fuck no, no. I want to stay home with my beautiful wife. Fuck that. Uh, in the oh, we've got a f just a few minutes left, so I'll give you these names. Ahmed Johnson. I don't know him. I actually have. He was wrestling him in 1994 for like Global. Oh, or in something. Texas. Yeah, Tony Norris. In Texas. Was, yeah. Okay. He are, okay. That's why because he switched his name. He was okay. I just didn't know him. No, it's okay. Ivan Putsky. Yeah, I liked Ivan Putsky. Mm -hmm. Hard to work with, but. Um, you know, he didn't want to sell nothing, and uh, but I wrestled him. Still had decent matches. I think he's a decent guy. Uh, he's a little bitty guy now. He looks like a fucking midget. <laughs> what What was his real height? Was it like five six even back then? Yeah, and now he looks like a little fire hydrant walking around. But he's <laughs> he lost all of his muscles. You know, <laughs> I met him. I didn't know who are you. I'm Ivan. I'm Ivan Pesky. <laughs> Yeah, he's got a kid, Scott Pesky. He had a lot of potential, mm. but I, I don't. Someone said he's doing something else now. Well, he's definitely not. But in he's the business. Also a little bit. He's definitely not. He's in the not. Business. No. No. Uh, but he, he had potential. Mm. Gene Labelle. Oh, great guy, Gene Labelle. Horrible announcer, but uh, you know he over exaggerated everything. But I listen to him now on those old Hollywood tapes, and I was there. And I guess it was good. He was kind of like David Crockett, kind of like not a, announcing wasn't his thing, right? Uh, but uh, he passed away, but he was a legitimate tough guy. Yeah. Gene LaBelle. And he got Roddy Piper to start, so. And he made Steven Seagal shit his pants. Probably. Yeah, I never heard that one. Oh, the story goes is that Steven Seagal but he, said. He's a, he did a lot of movies, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's, uh, Steven Seagal said, I cannot be choked out. Uh, I have a technique to not ever be choked out. I will never pass out from a sleeper hold or anything. So yeah. Judo Gene LaBelle gets him in the choke, and it turns out that Steven Seagal's like, counter is to punch Gene in the balls. So instead, oh, so Gene doesn't let go. Instead, what he does is crank down harder and make Steven Scal pass out, and then when he was unconscious, he shit his pants. That's the story. Oh, my God. Well, I never heard that story. Hey, there you go. There's That's another... a good story. Thanks for sharing yeah, that no, with me. No worries. Uh, that's my only Gene LaBelle story as well, so that's all I've got. Uh, I'll, I'll end on these two, and then I'll thank you for your time. Iron Sheik. I love the Iron Sheik. I saw the biography that they're doing right now on A&E, and, &E, and uh, oh, my God. I love the sheep, but he, uh, please, Lord, please help the Iron Sheik. He needs your help. What's I don't, what's his status at the moment, health wise? I I don't know. I don't know. He just looks terrible. Is he still making appearances? You know, he lost all of his teeth. Uh, no, he doesn't do anything. Mm. I hope they took care of him on that. Pay, give him a good payday for that video. You know, yeah. it's a hell of a documentary. I know they. I did one with. With Brutus and they they paid well, so get your money, man. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and we'll end on this one, and we always end on this one, pretty much. Andre the Giant, one of my best friends in the business. Uh, I think about him all the time. I love that guy. Really got to know him in Japan. I did like two different tours with him, three weeks over there with Andre every day all the fart stories and <laughs> going to the Korean barbecue and drinking beer and, and farting and, and more farting. <laughs> Were you on the plane when he did the world's biggest shit? Yeah. Yeah. They had to go back and, uh, and pull the curtains and uh, he couldn't, he couldn't fit in those. It was a 747 back then. He couldn't fit in those bathrooms in the back. So they had to hold up this, big friggin' sheet or curtain or something, and he shit in a bucket. <laughs> Where'd they find a bucket on the airplane? But they did, you know. 
<laughs> How did they get rid of the shit? <laughs> did they like jettison it? Or they they opened up the back of the airplane and like <laughs> stick his ass out the back. <laughs> <laughs> I know everyone asked this, but what's the most you ever saw Andre drink? Uh, well, in Japan, they used to give, give us those big beers. I call them oaky size, right? But they weren't the small beers like we have over here or in UK. So they was big beers, right? I bet you I saw him drink 30 beers. Could have been more. How much did he drink before a match? Uh, that depends on how much. He usually drank wine before the match. So I remember wrestling him in a single match at Elizabeth City, New Jersey College. And I'm, I, I realized I'm wrestling him in a single match. And he drank about six bottles of Beaujolais, French wine. And, uh... and then he came out and wrestled me and he farted on me. <laughs> And I smelled the red wine. I go, gee, what brand is that? Beaujolais. <laughs> and all the people laughed, you know, and, and now he's sitting on me and he's so drunk he can't get up. And I can't get out from underneath him. <laughs> no. I go, gee, is this all I'm going to do? Just lay here and have this giant sit on me and fart on me for 10 minutes? <laughs> it was a classic match. You earned your pay that day. Yeah, and then so. Yeah, and uh, just and one and, more to end it on. Is and, it true? And now that... every time I now every time I drink red wine, I get Beaujolais in honor to remind me of Andre. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, is it true that he shit on Bad News Brown in a match once? You know what? I saw the YouTube thing for Bad News Brown. Uh, I guess he did an interview about it. He said, "Is he claiming that?" Someone's claimed it. I just, I, I've just written it down. Yeah, there. I, I, I saw that, and I go, I saw that, and I was going to clip on it, but I didn't have time. I go, shit, I got my own stories. <laughs> Greg, <laughs> it has been a delight, a delight to have you on. It really has been. I know we did the Don Morocco one. We've done this one. It's been great to talk to you. Before I let you go, any plugs uh, you want to get out there? You've got some merchandise you want to. Uh, advertise for the fans. Yeah, just I'm going to give them my email. It's called Greg Valentine, or it is Greg Valentine forty nine, and uh, at gmail dot com. Yes, and uh, and I'm going to be putting out. I broke Wahoo's leg, um, my own version of it, and I broke Ric Flair's nose, and. Those would be my two main ones coming out. Oh, Chief J, leg. I broke Strombo's leg. I broke Wahoo's leg. Might just Chief's leg, but yeah. I, all of them, all of them are going to do good. And then especially, I broke Rick's nose, and, Rick Flair's nose, and you broke Donald Trump's heart when you lost to the earthquake at WrestleMania Seven. That's right. That's right. Shout out to Trump. Go Trump. <laughs> Right, for now, thank you very much, everybody watching. We'll be back whenever we're back. I don't know when these things come out anymore. It's so far in the future. But, for Greg, it's been a pleasure. Please come back on again if you're ever in the mood when to chat it, to me when again. When are you going to put this out? When are you going to put this out? Um, gets... So the one with you and Don Morocco I'll put out first, and then this one I'll probably put out a month or so later. So Don Morocco and you is going to be out end of May, maybe. And then this interview okay, is going to be July or something like that. Okay, great. I got them looking forward to it. And then you're coming to Vegas, right? Um, I might do. It depends how many of my friends decide that they're not poor. So okay, we well, email out. me about that too. Dude, I absolutely will. Uh, thank you so much, Greg. Thank you for watching, and we'll catch you again next time.